As Sharon said, today does mark the beginning of a new Christian year. It marks the beginning of the season of Advent. It marks our first steps. We're going to be reading the Gospel of Matthew all year. And so it marks our first steps in the beginning of Matthew. We'll jump out a couple times over the next 52 weeks, but for the most part, Matthew's Gospel is where we'll be. You've heard a lot, maybe, if you've been around, you've heard me talk in the past few weeks. Uh, I've been thinking about that old phrase, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And his day it was a pretty helpful phrase, like if you were at the, at, the, at the music record store, would you buy, before you bought that CD with the black label and the white words on it, you would ask yourself, what would Jesus do? Before you said ye- yes to dating that dangerous yet exciting new person in town that wore the leather jacket, you might ask yourself, who would Jesus date? No, what would Jesus do? And before you hit snooze on a Sunday morning, you should be asking yourself, what would Jesus do today? Now, I don't have to tell you, though, today in our day and age, it's a pretty divided time right now. We worship as part of a divided de- denomination, and some of us are struggling through the holidays and divided families, and somehow our religion, our faith, our decision to follow Jesus, the Messiah, the healer, the bringer of restoration, somehow our Christian faith has gotten swept up in a lot of that division. Our faith gets swept up in our politics, and our politics has gotten swept up on just about everything you can imagine. You can't make a decision anymore without it being political to somebody. We are a hot mess And I think part of this mess, at least for Christians, might come down to one word. Would. (laughs) Would. Because the word would is open-ended. It leaves too much space. The word would leaves space for conjecture. It leaves space for opinion. It leaves space for argument, which leaves space for division. Here's an example. I'm going to give you one question. It's a multiple choice quiz. All right? It's pass fail because it's either right or wrong, right? So which one of the following persons do you think would have directed an award-winning film about the life of Jesus? And he used nothing but the words from the Gospel of Matthew. Do you think this director would have been, one, an avant-garde artist, two, a Marxist dissident, three, an atheist, or four, a formerly incarcerated person. How many of you think it was one, the avant-garde artist? Two, a Marxist dissident writing and directing about Jesus. An atheist directing about Jesus, a few of you. A formerly incarcerated person writing an award-winning film about Jesus. Well, if you said one, you're right. If you said two, you're right. Three, four, you're right. In fact, it's all of the above, right? But I know from tests, if you put all of the above on there, you're all just, you just go with all of the above if it's not on any other, right? No. It is all of the above. Pier Paolo Pasolini released the Gospel according to St. Matthew in Italy in 1964. Pasolini was a rather famous artist. He was a Marxist atheist. And in 1960s, he was an openly gay man who had been jailed for making a film with that included Jesus earlier in his career. <laughs> that earlier film, though, wasn't necessarily what you would call an accurate depiction of Christ. His Matthew film, though, stuck as close as one can to the text. In fact, no words appear in his film that aren't in Matthew's gospel. There's no attempt, even as a lot of films do, to incorporate other gospels into this film. No room for opinion or conjecture, just the gospel, folks. And the film was universally praised. It won the grand prize at the Venice Film Festival. It had three Italian film industry awards. It was nominated for three Academy Awards. It was dedicated to Pope John the Twenty-Third, and it won the grand prize at the International Catholic Film Festival, which really, if you dedicate your film to the Pope, you're in pretty good shape at the, at the film festival. <laughs> The Vatican, in 2015, as recently as 2015, the Vatican newspaper called it the greatest film about Christ's life ever made. You wouldn't think 
that a guy like Pasolini would have written and directed a movie like that. A movie that has brought people to Jesus across the globe. I was reading about Pasolini in the last week. I immediately thought, you know what, this is perfect. Because the scripture, if you've read the big, Matthew, the, the first 17 verses, they're a trip. And so I was thinking, great, I'll just play the beginning of the movie, right? It's award-winning. I can't do better than that. Surely, if he's going to include the entirety of Matthew's gospel, surely if that's the only thing he's going to put in his movie, he would put the first 17 verses of Matthew in his movie. But remember what the word would does. (laughs) It gets us in trouble. Especially when biblical things are concerned, the word would sometimes creates a bit of a mess. And if I were to sit here and rely on his movie to get us through our scripture today, it would be a mess, because he didn't. (laughs) Vaseline didn't include the first 17 verses of Matthew in his film. In fact, most people like to skip over the first 17 verses of Matthew. I even tried to, last night, I'm like trying to trade with Shauna, like, hey, I'll, I'll welcome everybody if you read the scripture from Matthew today. She did not bite because she saw the words in the scripture today, so you're stuck with me. Pasolini and Pastor Shauna have both failed me today. <laughs> so this is the first 17 verses of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, 1 through 17. It's our very first introduction to Jesus in the New Testament. We read an account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. There's going to be another multiple choice test after this. Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nishan, and Nishan the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of who? King David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, who liked to jump, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Salathiel, and Salathiel, the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud, and Abiud, the father of Eliakim, And Eliakim, the father of Azor, and Azor, the father of Zadok, and Zadok, the father of Achim, and Achim, the father of Eliud, and Eliud, the father of Eliezer, and Eliezer, the father of Mathan, and Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you. We praise you for all those who come before us, all of those lives, those names we hear that lead us to your Son, Jesus Christ. And as we hear of them, Lord, we think of ourselves and our own families, the paths that led to us, paths that led us here today. So we pray, Lord, that we might hear from you why you have us here today. Why me? Why in this place? Why this morning? Speak to us, Lord. Amen. My family and I didn't go 
anywhere this year for Thanksgiving. So it was just, just the four of us and the dog and the three cats. But uh, <laughs> So as I was reading this, I'm like, oh, I didn't get that elderly relative to tell me who's related to, to who for an hour and a half as we sat around the table. So Matthew did it for us today. Um, and so maybe after reading that, right, I'm thinking, all right, so maybe reading all those, the father of, the father of, the father of, the father of, I can kind of see why Pasolini didn't include it in the movie. It might not have been an award-winning film had he done that. I mean, why would Matthew possibly want to start off his gospel, the beginning of the good news with a bunch of old news, right? I mean, those, some of those same genealogies are in the Bible elsewhere. We didn't need to go over this all again, right? And, and why would he want to, would, well, there's that word again, right? Why would Matthew want us to do that? One of the commentaries I on, studied on this passage had seven different reasons why Matthew would have wanted to include this. And they didn't always agree those reasons. Number two and number seven were fighting mightily. And number three and five, they never wanted to see each other again. Those, those reasons why. See what wood does to us? Once we bring the word wood into our conversations, we just don't want to be around each other. One of them I know would have probably divided us like the Red Sea had I brought it up in church today. We're not going to fall for the wood trap today. So this day and the rest of this year, we're going to ask a different question. It's a question we're going to ask every Sunday for the next 52 weeks. And I hope it's a question that you ask every day as you go to Scripture. And it's not what would Jesus do. It's what did Jesus do. What did Jesus do? Because we can save ourselves a lot of heartache if we just stick to the gospel truth. And read for ourselves what did Jesus do. And we're in luck because Jesus appears in the very first sentence of Matthew's gospel. Fancy that. An account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So what did Jesus do? Well, for one thing, he didn't just descend out of heaven, right? He didn't just appear out of nowhere. He descended from people. Jesus didn't even just show up one day on the banks of the Jordan like he does in the gospel of Mark. And he doesn't just hang around with God at the beginning of all things like he does in John's gospel. No, in Matthew's gospel, he done been born. He got borned. That's what Jesus did, just like all the other sons on earth. Just like all the other sons and daughters on earth, he was born into a complicated family. I mean, and who of us... Anybody here do genealogy every now and again? You like to poke around and see? Right. Anyone ever find the, like, uh uh-oh people in there? Like, oh, we'll just erase them from the tree. Or maybe that limb will fall off when it gets cold outside and the ice just pulls it down on the ground. This is what we find in Jesus' genealogy. We find Abraham. Abraham, a guy who didn't trust God, and so he slept with his wife's servant, to try to have the son that God promised. And then when he did, he kicked his son out of the house with his mom, left them in the desert to die. And then he almost sacrificed the son that he was promised. We find Isaac, who got tricked into giving his birthright to the wrong son. And then Jacob, the son who conspired with his mom to trick his dad to get the birthright. We get Judah, who refused to provide for his son's widow, Tamar. And then picked up a prostitute on the way back from the temple who, uh uh-oh, turned out to be his son's widow in disguise. Tamar had to trick Judah, Judah into doing what was right. And Tamar's son, Perez, had a son who had a son who had a son who had a son who married an actual prostitute. Her name was Rahab. And she provided the Israelites with the hospitality that God required of her, welcoming them in to the promised land. And this foreign woman gave birth to Boaz, who met another foreign woman named Ruth on the threshing floor one night. (sighs) And Ruth gave birth to Obed, who was the father of Jesse, who was the father of Israel's greatest king, a man after God's own heart, David. But David was also a man whose heart got him into trouble, or at least maybe his eyes (laughs) 
got him into trouble because David ordered his general Uriah's wife to be brought to him so that he might sleep with her. And when, before word could get around, he killed her husband. And Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, gave birth to Solomon, the wisest king, but also a king with wandering eyes like his pops. And while David had, had just took the general's wife, Solomon took 500 wives. <laughs> And the vast majority of his sons and their sons turned away from God, just like their dear old dad did when his wives showed him a different way. And eventually God was done with them and had the Israelites deported to Babylon. And when they returned to the promised land, they never really got things right for 13 more generations until there was another Israelite named Jacob who had a son named Joseph. And his son fathered the Messiah. Oh, wait. You, you might think that, that that's where all these father of, father of, like we've been, you know, 14 generations times three, a father of, father of, father of, fathered of. So you'd think it would be leading us to Joseph, the father of Jesus. I mean, I would, right? I would think that's where we're headed. But if you thought that, the word would, you'd be wrong. We'd be wrong because Matthew zigs through that genealogy of father of father of father of only to zag at the end that tell us that Joseph wasn't even the biological father of. Man, why did we have to listen to all those people and then at the end you said, oh no, by the way, it's this other person over here that's the mother of Jesus. He just, Joseph just happened to marry the mother of the Messiah whose name was what? Mary. Mary, the daughter of who? Exactly. <laughs> no one knows. <laughs> Unlike Joseph's family, Mary's family is lost to history. She's an unknown, a nobody compared to all those somebodies in Joseph's line. And yet, I don't know about you, but I take nobody over all those somebodies probably any day. And yet, she's not exactly a nobody. Because unlike most of the people in Joseph's line... The one thing we do know about Mary is that she said yes to God and gave birth to the one who would eventually save all of creation. That's a pretty big somebody, if you ask me. She said yes to God, and she bore Jesus, who is called the Messiah. She gave birth to the Savior, the Son of God, who is God. And actually, if you went into Matthew blind, not knowing what this story was about, those first 17 lines end with a pretty epic cliff cliffhanger. Like, if I were going to make movies aren't hip anymore, right? It's like eight, eight, eight episode series on TV is where it's at, right? So I'm ending the first episode of my series about the life of Jesus with the Gospel of Matthew on this we're building and building and building to joseph only to be told that he is not the father he's the husband of the mother but he's not the father which leaves you wondering cliffhanger what who's the father well stay tuned next week we're going to get into that <laughs> but this week we're back to our question what did jesus do and in this part of matthew it's really simple jesus the messiah the Son of God who is God was birthed by a human mom, a nobody who became somebody because of Jesus. And Jesus was adopted by a human father, somebody who had some pretty sketchy somebodies in their family line. There were a lot of skeletons in Joseph's family closet, and many of those skeletons might remind some of us of the dark times and the deep traumas that we read about in scripture and many of those skeletons might remind us of our own traumas and dark histories and yet what matthew's genealogy keeps reminding us is that through it all through all the trauma god was working through all those people through that whole line sometimes with us sometimes through us sometimes in spite of us to bring jesus to us and to bring us to Jesus. Because you see what this genealogy reminds us is that God's not done working with us, through us, in spite of us, to prepare our hearts and this earth for Jesus to come again. We've all got skeletons in our closets. Some of us are the skeletons in other people's closets. 
And yet God continues to use us. So that what was true of the 14 generations from Abraham to David and what was true of the 14 generations from David to the deportation and what was true of the 14 generations from the exile to the Messiah is still true of our generation, of your generation and my generation. And even though Pier Paolo Pasolini didn't have room for Jesus' genealogy in his story, God has room for an atheist, Marxist, avant-garde, gay artist with a criminal history in Jesus' story. And actually, Pasolini would take offense about that atheist thing, right? He certainly did later in life. You see, after going to prison for his first portrayal of Jesus on the screen, the Pope actually invited Pasolini to come to a monastery in southern Italy and and sit in on a seminar where the Pope had gathered non-Catholic, non-Christian artists and Christian artists to have a dialogue instead of just fighting and dividing and arguing with each other. He's like, hey, let's, let's talk it out. And they did. But here's the funny thing, that when the Pope shows up somewhere, it gets crowded. <laughs> it gets hard to get around. And Pasolini said, I got stuck in my room in a monastery. I'm an unbeliever. <laughs> Stuck in a room in a monastery. And when you're stuck in a room in a monastery, guess what the only thing you can find to read is? (laughs) The Bible. (laughs) He couldn't get out, and so he picks up the Bible, the only book in the room, and he read all four Gospels. And when he was done, he said, I couldn't get Matthew out of my head. He said that the idea of making a film out of Matthew's Gospel put everything else, every other idea for a movie he had into the shade into darkness, and all he could focus on was the story of Jesus. He was compelled to film the Jesus in Matthew's Gospel and to film it word for word from Scripture. God used Pasolini's story to tell Jesus' story to the world in a new way. And what was Matthew's in Matthew's Gospel? What's Jesus' final words? Go tell my story. And he did. And when asked why he, a rather famous non-believer, would make this film, later in life, Pasolini said, well, if you think I'm an unbeliever, you know me better than I know myself. And he left it at that. So what did Jesus do? In our scripture today, he was born. (laughs) He was born in such a way that tells us that he can be born again in any of, uh, like look around the room, like any one of these people can birth Christ at any given moment in your life or the life of someone else's, despite what we think of ourselves, despite what we think of, of them, despite what we think of our family trees. Amen? Jesus is still there. But, but there's a flip side to this, what did Jesus do question. And we're going to be asking it of ourselves all this year as well. That's what I want to leave you with today. Now that you know what Jesus did, you can ask yourself, what will I do? Now that you know there is room for you, even you in Jesus' story, what will you do? Will you look at yourself differently? Will you look at your family a little bit differently? We you look at your neighbors just a bit differently? At a time when Christians seem to arguing, be arguing a lot about who's in and who's out, like who should be let into our country, who should be let out of prison, who should be let into our churches, who should be let out to pasture, will you look at those around you just a bit differently? Or maybe for you this week the question really is, Who will I tell? Who do you know that needs to hear the good news that there is room for them in the story of Jesus? Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a loved one. Maybe it's you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you make room for us. 
even as it feels sometimes like the world doesn't make room for me. Or maybe sometimes I don't make room for others. We trust that we can look to you to find a place. That you provide us with a purpose that you would use us in new ways. That you would use us in spite of us to tell others about you. And the good news that you use them to. So in the season of Advent, Lord, prepare our hearts for Christ to be born in us again. That we might go and tell others the good news. Make disciples of others. Help them to see that they are somebody through you and your son, Jesus Christ, and the power of your Holy Spirit.